My name is Oliver Picard, and I've always dreamed of building my own car, together with my aerospace engineer and rallyist dad, Andrew. Hello. I found the perfect project. This is my Cox GTM. The remains of one of only 800 made. And that looks bad, but when you look at it from the inside, it's even worse. Crashed, fire damaged, rusted, unrestorable. We aren't just modifying, but completely re-engineering. We aren't just bolting on parts, we are making the tools that fabricate the parts to build my dream car. Bespoke one of one. This is Project Mosquito. Hello! Hello! <laughs> Welcome back to the workshop. So what we're doing this week, Dad? Well, we're going to do the, the side pieces for here. But obviously both sides and we're going to do the passenger side front of the footwell we're not going to do the driver's side because we've got the pedal box to do and the steering to put in and we haven't made those yet no so that's uh, another thing that's still on the list <laughs> the the thing is we've got a bunch of stuff to do that we can't do yet until we've done this stuff we need to finish these but bu one bulkhead at least and get all of our dimensions in and we need to do the some of the rear firewall and some of the rear floor and then we can do all the fun stuff like the shift mechanism, like the steering, like the pedal box. But all of that stuff kind of comes towards me and we need some stuff in place before we put other stuff in place. Yeah. So even though doing the panels isn't like, woohoo, make a shiny thing. You know, I get, I get comments every now and then that are, you know, shut up and make a shiny thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and for those people, this video might not be for you, but on the plus side, we aren't breaking any ground engineering wise, so there will be a lot of me shutting up. <laughs> but the shiny thing doesn't come yet. It's a bit like finishing your peas before you have your dessert. You're when you're a kid and your mum goes, no, you can't have your dessert until you finish your peas. It's a bit like that. So let's, let's make some, uh, some shiny metal, let's sheet metal peas. Make some metal peas, yeah. <laughs> we need a triangle yeah. or half a pyramid if you prefer. And to put in here with a bend in the middle. So we need a piece of cardboard to make a triangle and then need a piece of steel to make a metal triangle yep. out of a cardboard triangle. And we need to put a, a flange. A flange? A flange on there. So we need to chop the bit off. We'll cut it at that, mm -hmm. it's a bit big, and then if yeah. we need to trim it, we can trim it up. Uh, one mil? Uh, no. Uh, sorry, uh, half mil. Half mil. Super! What do you reckon to the new layout, by the way, with the car at an angle? Hopefully it'll be a bit, uh, a bit more, which one's the one we use in that one? Be a bit more cinematographic. and we will end up working in full sun. <laughs> so, that one. that's what we're using. This is the one we're not. I'll put it in the right hand file. Oh, you oh no! You done a bit. really need to get some duct tape yep. and duct tape this gym mat together. I saw that in like um, one of these cheap shops that sells everything and uh, in France it's called Action and, uh, and I thought hey that's a good idea they're like reasonably cheap reasonably you know uh, expandable and, and stuff so I bought two lots and it's okay except for every time you move it it falls apart so it's such a pain in backside to move we end up just not using it
and it needs a bit I believe is the uh, technical term Do you know what it reminds me of, don't you? A cow catcher. A what? A cow catcher. You know the thing that they put on the front of a train? Oh. That's what they call it, yeah? yeah? I don't know if that's a technical term. I'm just flattening it out in the middle. Yeah. Less bend here. Yeah. Pop it out for this CPR. That's better. Yeah, put a little flange off. Mm hmm. This should be five mil, won't it? Yep. Put plenty of meat on it for a flange. So, flange, flange, flange. This already has a flange. Yep. And then I get to drill a million holes. So one of the things that a lot of people said last week, well, a lot of people, two, <laughs> said, um, but you mean a lot to me, um, <laughs> uh, said to me was, why don't you use a punch instead of uh, drilling holes? The reason why these are such tiny little um, plug welds is so that you can put them closer together and they don't put as much heat into what you're welding and that helps stop deforming. It's loads better to do like loads of teeny, teeny, tiny ones than like loads of big like yeah. five mil ones. Yeah. Because you just get loads of distortion then. It's not, not just that, that's actually the metal is only half a millimetre thick. So by the time you'd welded a five mil hole, you'd have probably lost part of the, your parent metal. Yeah, well you, and the MIG way that you used to weld um, half mil thick steel is, um, is comma six. Comma six. Which is what, 24,000? So, in old money. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's simply a case of little tiny plug welds that are closer together yield a better result. The best result would probably be uh, a spot welder, but you can't spot weld onto a tube. <laughs> so yeah. Well, see, even TIG welding would put too much heat in. Yeah. You'd have to have it, cause, because you're welding half mil to two mil. Mm -hmm. So by the time you got the two mil warm enough to weld, it would have burnt away the, the half mil. Yeah. So that's why we're doing it the way that we're doing it. It's time consuming, but it's worth it. I think. Well, mark it all up and I'll start drilling then.
Yeah, it's gotten in. Jolly good old boy. Somebody in the comments recommended that we try doing a gentle bead roll one way first and then doing it the wrong way and then going back over ourselves to pre-stretch our metal. What do you think? Is it worth a try? On Probably, but not on a piece that we've just been doing. <laughs> <laughs> this is the biggest problem with this kind of kind of thing is that you spend so long making it that you you're massively invested time wise and you really don't want to make it again and you really don't want to stuff it up we've got to come to a point there haven't we hmm? we've got to come to a point there okay I know, I just don't like the feel. <laughs> And this is the thing, it's, it's been such a, a panel to make this panel and it's so pretty and it fits so well that we almost didn't want to bead roll it. We had, we had a discussion about whether to bead roll it or not. To bead roll or not to bead roll? Yeah. That is the question. Hurry up. <sighs> That's right, that, that'll pull in when we weld it. Yeah, give it a, look, a bit more of a bend. And if you've noticed the little space in the end, what we'll do is we'll put a little tiny cut in the bend here and then we'll just tap it down with a hammer and weld it round and weld the, weld the little cut. Okay, up it is. Yay. Right, now we need to make another one. Another!
Every week I get at least one email from somebody asking what project car they should build. They want to either design their own car or they want to build their own car or they want to build a car based on something else. And I always say to them, if you want to build a car that's based on something else, pick the best chassis you can afford. And it's easier to make a good chassis great than it is to make a bad chassis good. Because power is easy. All you need for power is money. And power is easy to achieve. Power is easy to make. And you can throw a big engine in anything. You know, I'm on YouTube. It's the home of throwing a stupidly big engine in everything. But as Pirelli once quite rightly said, power is nothing without control. And control starts at the chassis. And what I'm talking about is something called torsional rigidity. If you're a bit older, you might know it's torsional stiffness. We don't say torsional stiffness anymore because it's misleading, right? But torsional stiffness, simply, or torsional rigidity, simply means the ability of a car to twist like this. So this entire chassis to twist. And it's done in um, degrees per newton meter or whatever, right? But it's basically tested by jacking up three corners of the car and then applying force to one corner of the car and seeing how much that chassis deflects. And the reason why it's so important is that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. We all know this. We're all, you know, unless, if you're older than four years old, you know this, right? But that goes for everything. So, for instance, when a spring compresses, it pushes into the ground, creating grip, but it also pushes back up into your car and it wants to bend your car, All right? So even if you have a really stiff shock tower, it's gonna find something else, it's gonna follow the chain. And all four wheels, obviously are, oh, the springs are expanding and contracting. Every time the tire pushes into the ground, it creates an equal force back up into your chassis. And so under acceleration, under braking, but also under cornering, your car is trying to twist itself constantly. Now, torsional rigidity is, everyone always says, oh, more is better, right? And that's kind of true. But when it comes to the greatest handling car that's ever existed, according to many, many people with opinions that I trust, they say the Lotus Elan, the original Lotus Elan is the greatest handling car ever, which basically has a chassis with the torsional stiffness of wet spaghetti. And that's because it has little tiny tires that were designed in the 1960s that aren't very grippy. And it's also got super soft springs. So that torsional stiffness is very forgiving and it creates a car that's very forgiving to drive. And the car that that inspired, of course, is the MX-5, the, the yeah, Mazda Miata, right? Which is famous. Chris Harris once said that the Mazda Miata has the torsional rigidity of a Haribo crocodile, <laughs> right? Of a gummy sweet. And the reason is, it's not very stiff. But the one place they made sure it was stiff was between the gearbox and differential. There's a bridge that runs under. The reason is, every time you accelerate in a car, that's front engine rear wheel drive, it wants to twist the car. And Mazda wanted to make the MX-5 nice and compliant, nice and loosey-goosey. But they didn't want it to twist every time you accelerate, so they put a bridge from the gearbox to the diff. Because otherwise it would have so much torque the chassis twisted off the line, family. <laughs> right? And so that's great. Yeah, MX-5, lovely handling car. Lotus Elan, lovely handling car. So why do we all want torsional stiffness? Why is torsional stiffness better? There's a very good reason, and that's grip. The second you try and put grip into a chassis, that chassis then massively lowers its slip angle. And so it doesn't want to slide around everywhere, and it doesn't want to, like... You know, when you watch old um, Grand Prix videos and stuff like that, and 
of cars, like Formula One cars, before before they had wings and they're going around corners or all Lamont cars and they're doing that thing where they do the four wheel slide out of every single corner. That is slip angle, right? And a nice loosey goosey chassis. Your old Lotus Cortinas are superb for that. Old Lotus Cortina videos, like British touring car videos, are superb. Um, and basically, it allows the car to slip and slide. It creates a really compliant chassis, but the second you try and get that thing to grip, it's just going to twist it. And, of course, the first thing people do is throw a bunch of spring at the problem. And they put massive anti-roll bars on. But, of course, if you have a twisty chassis and you put a big anti-roll bar tying your front wheels together, what's that anti-roll bar doing? but bending your chassis. So you go into a corner, your car goes to roll, that loads up that anti-roll bar, and it all goes into the chassis. And I can prove it, because they make MX-5 Miata anti-roll bar mounts that are like super beefed up, because track MX-5 Miata, so especially, you have to remember that tyre technology in the last like 25 years has massively improved as well. But people take a, a Mazda Miata that was on like a 175 14 inch wheel tyre, right? And they put it on like an 18 or a 17, right? And they put Toyo R 888s on it, hoi it round the track, and they snap their anti roll bar mounts because they put a massively stiff anti roll bar in, and that anti roll bar <laughs> isn't actually acting like an anti-roll bar it's just bending your chassis and that's a huge issue and it's one of the reasons why i think that as far as pleasure of driving an mx5 you're probably better with a slippier tire as far as all these aftermarket braces that you can buy to bolt onto your car that add a load of weight that don't really add that much rigidity you're probably better off just putting a less sticky tyre unless you're doing autocross or track days. So what's the solution to our problem? Well, when the competition prepare any sort of shell for either touring car racing or rally, they do what's called seam welding where they, <laughs> they go around a car and they add welds about year long to every single seam in the, in the monocoque shell and stiffen it up massively and then they weld a roll cage in it and this increases the torsional rigidity of that chassis beyond belief and that then creates a really good handling car and it allows them to run much softer springs than they would have been able to it allows them to run much softer anti-roll bars than they would have been able to and i'm not picking on mx5 specifically um i know an mr2 like uh, an mrs the last like third generation MR, MR2, the whole front cradle that holds the steering rack in flexes like this when you go around corners because it was never made for that amount of grip. And this is vital for anybody who really loves classic cars as well. Like if you really love classic cars and you want to make a classic car handle, then you gotta, you've got to increase that torsional rigidity because if you want to put sticky tyres on, it's what it takes. Now, the other solution is to that is to weld in um, plates. I hate the term plates, but to weld in gussets and plates and reinforcements. So things like this that are bead rolled, dimple dyed, and physically stitch weld them into your car. It's very difficult to increase your torsional rigidity without gaining a ton of weight. Not literally a ton, but in some cases, depends what the car is. Um, it's very, very difficult. And that's one of the reasons why, with our old chassis, damaged as it was, and as rough as it was, and as unrestorable as it was, we didn't just build back the same thing. Because you need the torsional rigidity if you're gonna do this. Now, this car won't have super sticky tires on, that's not what it's for. But I need that control for something else. I need that control because this car has the same power to weight ratio as a Ferrari F40, only it's shorter than a Miata. In fact, the car itself is the same length as a Honda Beat, a K car. So, you know, you don't want, you don't want 
like your super short wheelbase cars to be super, super twitchy. In fact, one of the guys in the GTM group on Facebook, who, lovely chap, he left me my most favorite comment I think I've ever gotten, which is he rallies a GTM. He has a GTM. He knows what he's like. He's put, you know, hours and hours of his life and thousands of pounds of his own money into making a GTM handle as good as he can make it. And he, yeah, he turned around, uh, turned around to me when I bought this thing, and he goes, "So what you're going to do is have the world's fastest crash," <laughs> because he knew that a GTM chassis just isn't stiff enough. A GTM chassis just cannot take it, but this definitely can. And all of this uh, monococking that we've done, for lack of a better term, is all in aid of that because I couldn't make a space for it. We didn't have the room for it. So we had to create a system of basically the panels that you would fit inside a space frame that would create a chassis in a chassis. It's a turducken. You know, when they make a turducken, it's a, what is it, a turkey inside, inside of a duck, inside of a chicken. I, I don't eat meat, but it's, it's a mosquito turducken. It's very carabase. It's very insect-like, but it, it will work. And we've done it with half millimeter steel like this stuff weighs next to nothing. It's incredible. You got it? Well, I, that's the first time it's ever come out that way. <laughs> Just doing. Right. Um. <laughs> so what are you doing, Dad? So what I'm doing is actually cutting the end of the tunnel off and putting uh, three flanges on. So we can actually weld the bulkhead to the mm -hmm. transmission tunnel eventually. Um, obviously you can see with millions of panels, they don't actually weld it together. And it's the problem of this. Because this has lots and lots of things inside it, um, which we can't do. So it's like a shifter, electrics, everything. Um, we need to put mounting points in for all the, the tube work. We need to be able to get in and out with the electrics. Eventually, the underneath section of this will be removable for maintenance. But obviously, we can't work upside down uh, in a dark tunnel. So we can't weld it in, basically, until we get all, all our accoutrements in there. <laughs> accoutrements, car accoutrements. Yeah, things like the shifter and stuff and the handbrake cable and all the... We need to put, like, a trunking guide for electrics and fuel lines, water lines, all that stuff. We've said that in previous videos, but for those who, have, who are just joining us, and uh, we also want to f make this nicer as well. This tunnel was, yeah, it's a bit rough inside. It's a bit uh, agricultural, as you say. Yep. And uh, we just bought the MIG weld and we were just getting used to it. But it was a good proof of concept at the time. We just, it's hideous. And we've, yeah, everything's so nice. That's... Uh, that's the problem. I have, a, I have a friend who always says with his cars that the problem with making one thing nice in your car or buying like one really nice part is then you've got to make everything else just as nice. Otherwise, it's all hideous by comparison. And uh, that's kind of the problem we've got. In, in most of this, it'd be reasonably acceptable. But because everything else is so nice, it, uh, it has to be nice as well. And of course, we'll have to seam weld all this and and finish all that off and make it look like it's never been messed with. Right. All right. Well, now we've got our, our flange marked out, we can chop it off mm. and lose a little bit more weight. Yay. Every, that's it. Every time we cut a bit off, just think, that's a little bit more weight gone. Um, so yeah, cut it, weld it, bend it, flange it, bop it. You know when people talk about in videos and stuff, like whether you should go for a, a monocoque chassis or a, a tube frame chassis, one of the biggest considerations should be your next door neighbour's willingness to, to listen to your <laughs> smack sheet nettle for hours. Luckily we don't have a problem. Nope. It's one of the nicest things about being in a rural community. 
you, there'll be somebody in the valley using a grinder at all times or hitting something with a hammer or trying to get an old tractor running or and it's just part of it yeah, using a chainsaw yeah The thing is building a, a car like this is it's a bit like a, a game of chess. You've got to be like eight moves. You've got to think eight moves ahead of yourself. Since when did you play chess? Well, that's what I imagine it's like. <laughs> on the sheet metal. Right, this circle needs making bigger. Yeah. There's no way around that. We've got to cut it out to here, make it bullet shaped and take some out of the radius, yeah? It's got to happen. Because it, it rubs on the seam at the minute. See yeah. Bit there. Oh. You only take from this out, because you see how it's bent out. Um. Very many things. <laughs> so what were we doing again? Stella. Bulkhead front. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it started as. Yeah. Stay. We need a way to hold this up. A block of wood and an axle stand. I can't push this further forward as well. Yeah, that's got him. Ha ha! Right. Right, we'll cut it out of battle. Right? And is our flange long enough to reach? Yeah, there and have, yeah? Yeah, more than. Cool. Superb. I can't. There's a, a camera in front of me. Earn me money. Ha! What money? <laughs> There's supposed to be money. <laughs> Off, eh? 
those slanted you just put on earlier. Yes, Dad. <laughs> My fault, should have thought of it earlier. So, I should explain. We are getting rid of the flanges that we previously flanged because instead, when I've looked at it, I said, well, why don't we just make this flange really long? Because both the tunnel and the, the console are both at the same angle. So in theory, that should run up both of them. And then we can just shorten the flange on the uh, tunnel a tad to get rid of the extra weight that we don't need to be carrying. It looks a bit weird and boxy at the minute because it's actually in at the top and out at the bottom, but it's not rigid enough until we bead roll it to, to stay where it needs to live. But uh, it feels really weird seeing it with foot welds. Funny, isn't it? When was the last time you stared at a car's like inner foot weld from the other side? Most cars, you have to take the engine out. <laughs> Large radius 52, small radius 40. A few people have had questions about resonant frequencies and it's for very good reason. Um, frequencies in any structure can be massively destructive. Uh, Nikola Tesla, I think, was the person who actually discovered it. But uh, there's loads of videos online of like a bridge hitting its resonant frequency with cars driving over it. And basically when something hits a a destructive resonant frequency, the, the vibrations within it end up going round and round and round and round and round and just destroying the thing and rattling it to bits. And one of my concerns with this car, because it's going to be so stiff, was that it would ring like a bell. Um, because it's like, it's a super stiff thing, it's a super, it's a, obviously all welded structure. And so I was really concerned that, that it would kind of have a tone on the motorway. And one of the ways that we're getting around that is by doing things like this and having irregular patterns and not all the same pattern. And that'll help to break up those frequencies within the, uh, within the car. Yeah, so you just take a normal piece of steel, flat steel with no bead rolls in or anything, and you do this. Without, without the, the bead rolls, basically the whole flat structure of the car would sound like that. And can you hear that ring when it, when it rattles? So as you're going down the road and your car's vibrating, you get that ee through the whole thing. Just like, a, just like a bell. When you ring a bell, because a bell is a perfectly regular structure, um, when you hit it, it rings or a tuning fork and we didn't want this thing to be a tuning fork. So irregular structures really help. Another thing that helps is the different thicknesses of materials because we have two mil tube, we have one mil steel um, sheet and we have half mil steel sheet. And each one of those structures all resonates at a different frequency. And when you get different frequencies running into each other, they tend to cancel each other out. <coughs> Even though this is a, a reason of a flat sheet because we've put the bends in the flanges in sounds different now once we put the dimple that the bead rolls in mm -hmm. it should be even better yep
You turn? No, it's got stuff. So now we'll so now we'll do the wobble test. After we've bead rolled it, and the wobble test. The wobble test. It's an official factory term. We are the factory, and it's a term. Yeah. So there you go. Nothing. <coughs> and hopefully, when it's all welded together, and it's all one unit, it won't have a resonant frequency, which will make a huge difference when you're in the car at a sustained speed, won't it? Yeah. Um, so like on the most one, a long distance journey. The problem with a four cylinder engine is they are naturally not very balanced. And so they tend to have a resonant frequency to them. It's why your four cylinder cars aren't great on a road trip. Um, and you want like a nice drag V12 that's like buttery smooth and because that has a very, like, almost non-existent frequency. And because it has overlapping cylinders, where a four-cylinder doesn't. So, and it's a K-series, which is quite a tall engine, and it's quite vibrating. And we've got quite firm engine mounts. So it's not going to be like, it's no Rolls-Royce. But, hopefully, that will make things nice. And the thing is, you want to have a lot of cabin noise. You want to be able to hear the engine, after all. Yeah. You don't want to have to have it piped in. No. <laughs> piped in through the speakers. Well, have you seen those Audis now? Audis actually have a subwoofer in the exhaust. Did you? No, there's an electric, like, actual speaker built into the exhaust of a modern car to make it loud because the, the engine is naturally quiet. Well, Dad, it does look a bit higgledy-piggledy, doesn't it? It does, but it's only it's only clamped together, you know. We don't even have any Clico um, pins to hold everything together. That's it. We, we looked at Clicos. We thought about buying Clicos because we know how good they are, but you can't Clico to a tube. And no. so you, you'd only be able to hold, like, half of this stuff together. Yeah. And it would have been, like, 150 euros spent that can be spent doing other stuff. And we do have a really cool very intricate project which although it's a lot cheaper than it otherwise would have been yeah. it ain't that cheap like we still have to buy loads of stuff yeah but in comparison yeah so we at the minute we are kind of building up to something mega and we are working behind the scenes in fact we are, we've been working that much behind the scenes that this video uh, will have been up in fact, it goes up now, tomorrow. <laughs> In exactly 24 hours from now to the minute, this video will be live. And I've got a lot of editing to do. But uh, yeah, we've, we've been working like behind the scenes and doing a lot of planning and stuff because we've got a really awesome project coming. But for a part of a car that you never see, this looks superb. Because yeah. that's it. When was the last time you, you've stared at the back of your own firewall? Um, and when this is all in it'll have a it'll have a fuel tank here and a spare tire on top of it <laughs> you, you really won't be able to see it, it. All, yeah. no but it it'll do the job and that's the important yeah. thing and it'll keep it'll keep the wind in the rain out which yeah. is super important yeah stop me getting <laughs> mud up my pant leg um, but no it'll add strength and it'll make it all like super rigid and and super stiff and that's yeah. that's the really important thing and me safe and all of that and 
I know someone will say it down in the comments below, we're going to use a four hinged um, pedal box with the mass cylinders underneath my feet because it's a comfy way for me to sit and there it is a super technically superior form of pedal box isn't it yeah. than a top hinge pedal box so we don't need strength in this area in that way nope. so i won't because you don't want to be pushing on a, a sheet anyway it's not it's, it's not good that's embedded and we don't do embedded but um yeah really happy and we have a template that won't work for next week <laughs> <laughs> um the 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 body side will, but the, the inner side will have to be extended a bit. Yep. But next week, you've got to look forward to no, going to do... No, we're not doing that. Are we not? No, we're doing the rear um, firewall. Oh, yeah. We can't do this bit because we've got to do the steering and the pedal box. Yes. Yes, very true. We've got the sides of the firewall and the four pieces, yeah? Yeah. The rear four pieces to go in next week. Oh, that's really exciting. One step closer to sitting in it. <laughs> That's my goal. That's it. No, right, when you do something like this, you have to set little goals for yourself. Because if the goal was running, driving car, like I'm three years in at this point. Yeah. We had we our anniversary of buying the car the other day. And if, you ran, and if that was your goal after three years, you'd, you'd just be like, you'd run out of steam, wouldn't you? You just said buying the car. Yeah. Oh, that's a very loose term. No, buying the body, buying the <laughs> shell, buying the trash destroyed thing that's at the beginning of the intro of this video. Um, but we're three years in, yeah. basically, and you'd have run out of steam by now. And what you've got to do, you've got to set yourself like little goals all the time. So things like getting the, getting the tube frame kind of on the table and, and in a shape, yeah. getting the engine in the tube frame, getting it on its wheels, like all of these stages you know rear suspension then front suspension you've got to chop it up into little bits because otherwise you'd you'd run out of steam you'd yeah. run out of want to do wouldn't you yeah and you've got to you've got to be able to pace yourself yeah no point going guns haul for six months getting fed up and then it sits in the back of the garage for the next 10 years one of my biggest frustrations with youtube project cars and we are this is a youtube project car even though it's my car is that people finish them and they never do anything with them and the reason is, they're usually not very good. Um, they are SEMA cars, yeah. and and you know you know SEMA car like the big show in Las Vegas. Like and SEMA cars are famous for their Bluetooth prop shafts, and <laughs> like they are they they're famous for not being very well screwed together. And the reality is that this has to be well screwed together because it's my car, and I want to like do awesome stuff with it. Yep. And so it's worth taking the time to get it right. And uh, I always read every single one of your comments and your comments are one of these things that really keeps us motivated. Yeah, yeah. so don't forget, do leave us a comment. Tell us what you think. And I, I really mean that, by the way. I'm not just one of these people who's like, oh, I, I read every comment and then doesn't. No, I will reply to every single comment I personally have time to. Yeah. And I take the time to read them all to and you, if, don't I? Yeah. And if somebody has got a better idea than what we're doing, let us know. Because yeah. nobody's an expert on everything. And if somebody out there knows something that we don't, tell us. Yeah. And I even like, sometimes people go, well, have you tried this? And I'm like, yeah, I would have tried that, but, you know what I mean? And also there are no stupid questions. A lot of people, they message me like privately and they're like, I was afraid to ask this in the comments because I was scared I wouldn't be made fun of. Our comment section is the nicest comment section on YouTube. And if anybody makes fun of anybody in our comment section then they won't be in our comment section anymore there are no stupid questions and there are no bad questions to ask not everybody knows everything and that's okay and the fact is we learn by asking so no one should ever be afraid to ask because there's a hell of a lot of stuff in this car that i didn't know and i had to ask and i had to learn and that's that's awesome like that's why we're here you know and it's why i like to tell you why we're making the decisions that we're making as we go and yes, there are other ways to do it, you know, it's a thing with engineering, isn't it? Yeah, that, it's, it's, there's a million ways to do one thing. Mm. And it's finding the best way for your application budget and the tools that you have. And uh, so, yeah, thank you all for watching. It's, it's, it's been really awesome since we've, we had a little break. We came back to doing this and the, the response from the community has been overwhelming. And so thank you. Like, yeah, that's absolutely amazing. And, uh, We'll see you all in the... Oh, 
There'll be a button that looks like my face. Um, there's the playlist with every single one of these videos. So if, if you're watching this, you're like, oh my God, episode 60. Oh, don't worry. There's a big playlist there so that you can binge watch all of these videos. And there'll be an arbitrary video that I'll choose somewhere on the screen. So thank you all for watching. Please be awesome to each other. And uh, we'll see you all in the next one. Bye-bye. Yep.